our age, but for whenever they talk about the Olympics, I think it was the Olympics or it was NBC Sports. Maryville was the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat was always what they'd say. And when it was like the thrill of victory, it was this person like waving who won a gold medal. And then maybe you remember too, John, and the agony of defeat was some dude biffing it on like a ski. It's a skier like running into a pole or something like that. Just like skier. Yeah, down the hill and just eats it hard. But that was always like the, that was like, oh, ABC Sports, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. And um, that's kind of where this title comes from. But um, we're in Revelation 14. And I wanted to read it really fast because I forgot to ask someone to read it. So I'm just going to do it. And um, remember, this is, just to recap, this is John, who wrote the book of John, who wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. John, the oldest living apostle. All of them were martyred, as far as we know, except him. Uh, history tells us he was dipped in oil, but he survived somehow. Uh, was sent to die on, in, on Patmos, this island which still exists. Uh, he was exiled for many years, uh, but he didn't die there either. And so when a more church-friendly uh, Roman emperor came to power. Uh, they freed him, and he spent his last days ministering to the church in Ephesus until he died. And so uh, he's a unique character in the Bible. He's always the one who, uh, it's kind of funny when you read his book, he like points out, like he's just a little bit of a bragger. He'd be like, you know, I got there faster than Peter. He points out that he's faster than Peter when he ran to the tomb and always calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved. So um, maybe a little pride issue, but besides that, um, he's solid. And so this is... Uh, Revelation 14. So remember, Revelation is a, it's a, it's a picture. The, the way we're, we're teaching through it, you, there, there's four different ways to go through the book. We've talked about that in detail, to translate the book. It's, 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 it's often avoided because it can be confusing to exposit. Um, but two of the more common ways is a futuristic approach where you view everything past chapter 3 as stuff that's yet to come. Uh, there's a preterist approach, which is you view everything was pretty much fulfilled before 70 AD. There's a historicist approach, is where you kind of view this as a symbolic picture of the church through the ages. And there's an idealist or symbolic approach, where you view this as apocalyptic literature. It's prophetic. It's got epistles in it, but it's largely allegorical. And it's the only bi it's the only book of the Bible I'd say that about. And so the the big picture that it's trying to show you over and over and over again is that there's a battle between good and evil. Life is war. The forces of evil will come against the church, and we will feel that, that force, that, that oppression, but we prevail in the end. We win. And so over and over again, it's showing you that the battle is real, the opposition is real. John's even showing you how the opposition might look, but it's always reiterating the fact that the lamb that was slain reigns forever. Jesus, who was the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world, is now the Lion of Judah, and he will conquer all the enemies of the church in real time, because the church was persecuted when this was written, and over all time. And so that's kind of, that. just keep that in mind as we go through these chapters. John is just showing you like a thousand different ways to show that point over and over again. All right? So with that in mind, uh, read with me, please. So then I looked, and behold, this is again Revelation 14. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood a lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except for the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as the first fruits from God in the Lamb, and in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, and language, and people, and he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of judgment has come. And worship him who made the heavens and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. Another angel, a second, followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual morality. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in its image and receives a mark on his forehead or his hand, 
He will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. These worshipers of the beast in its image, whoever receives the mark of its name. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus Christ. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like the Son of Man, with a golden crown on his head, and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest on the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the altar, the angel who had the authority over fire, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it on the great winepress of the wrath of God, and the wine press was trodden outside the city. The blood flowed from the wine press as high as a horse's bridle for 600 stadia, which is roughly 200 miles. The word of the Lord. Um, pray with me, please. So, God, we thank you for your word, God. Sometimes your word is, is well, well, Peter even said it about Paul. It's, it, the, the things he writes are difficult to understand. Uh, but we believe it's your word, we believe it's inspired, we believe it's holy, we believe it's infallible, and, and we believe it's for us, God. So today, uh, fill me with your spirit as I try to just make sense of what you're trying to say to the church back then and, and to us today. And we just ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So, um, as always, I like to start off with a why. Um, when I lecture at college or when I speak at church, I think if you don't know why, you should listen to me. It's easy just to tune things out and just like, well, this isn't relevant at all. Uh, I think this is profoundly relevant because it concerns the two destinations that everyone will face on planet Earth. You, me, everyone who's ever existed, anyone who ever will exist, will one day, the Bible says, face this reality of salvation or judgment. It's why we celebrated Easter and why we celebrated the, the victory of Christ over death. Because we believe through Christ and Christ alone, salvation is possible. And without that, then you've got to face judgment, right? And it's much more than uh, being a good person. Because that's usually like, well, why should you go to heaven? Most people say, well, because I'm a good person. Well, the Bible reiterates over and over again that, well, no one is good. We might do good things. But if people could really see our thoughts, if people saw every action, we do a lot of bad things. And so when you think of the notion of heaven or nirvana or Shangri-La or any concept of, of this perfect place, uh, you've got to be perfect, the Bible says, to dwell there. So when you face this judgment, you've got two options. You're either made perfect through Jesus, which is what we believe as Christians, or somehow you've got to hope that you live this perfect life. And you've never sinned, therefore you don't deserve to die, which the Bible says is an impossibility. But even if reincarnation was a thing, I don't care how many layers of life you need to kill back, you're never going to live a perfect life. I'll give you a thousand out of a thousand, and you will never live a perfect life. So this whole idea of life is an onion, and you get one life and another life and another life, to me that just seems like a frustrating impossibility, because I don't care how many lives you get, you're going to make mistakes. All right, so... The reality of this and why it's important is because it's a destination that we've all got to deal with. I also ran out of printer paper, so I got really creative with my this paper here. Um, and so um, this this text is really interesting because it's showing you uh, the, the the culmination of uh, like the day of the Lord. This is this is what all the prophecies in the Old Testament and so much of the New Testament pointed ahead to. This is the day where if anybody has ever been wrong. If you've seen uh, human trafficking and been frustrated by it, if you've seen slavery and been frustrated by it, if you've seen racism and been, fr and been frustrated by it, if you've seen the un people uh, just unjustly tried and been frustrated by it, uh, from, from lynchings to, to, to pedophilia to any ugly thing that's ever happened in humankind, this is the day of reckoning. So this is a day 
that many who long for righteousness and who long for things to be made, be, to be made right, who long for real justice, this is the day that's happening right now. So it's a wonderful day if you're in that camp that's longing for reckoning, and, and it's a horrible day if you're in the other camp that's caused all the pain. So, uh, so the, the first thing we want to look at, and, and I want to take this kind of four ways, is the thrill of victory, the agony of defeat, the reality of both, and the cost of both. With the thrill of victory. So, if you remember back in chapter five, uh, John looks up into heaven. The first thing he sees is this throne, and, and, and besides this throne and the throne is where God the Father sits, he sees a lamb that looks like he was slain. And we see the beautiful thing about that is it's Jesus, Jesus who who literally died on the cross for our sins and bears those scars forever. He's scarred forever so that we can be made whole and be beautiful forever. And that's that's a wonderful thing about the gospel. So he sees the throne. He sees Jesus, the, the lamb that was slain. He sees 24 elders, which is another one of many pictures of the church, as we'll see in a second. So the 24 elders represent the 12 disciples and the 12 tribes of Israel together, representing the people of God. And they, they've got their own little thrones. And so this idea, this reoccurring theme of us reigning with Christ, you see that fulfilled in heaven. And so now, be between 5 and 14, we've seen a lot of things go down. Last week, Lewis taught about this kind of crazy. This is the stuff I used to read about when I was born in my Baptist church. I read about monsters in Revelation. I was thinking Godzilla and all these things. But this, this giant monster comes out of the ocean. Another one comes out of the land. Uh, this dragon that, that, that kind of breathes life and empowers them both. And, and remember, one thing Revelation also shows is this unholy trinity. So if you get Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you'll see lots of fabrications, mimicry from the devil. You'll see the dragon, the beast from the land, and the beast from the sea. You'll see the harlot, the false prophet, and the beast. You'll see the number six, six, and six. Man, 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 as opposed to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The exaltation of God versus the exaltation of man. So last week we see this beast coming out of the ocean one represented power and then you see this beast coming out of the land the other represented heresy and those are two consistent to this day opposers of the church and the people of god false teaching and just brutal violence against the church we'll either cut your head off or we'll quench the spirit through diluting the word of god and leading you astray to 101 false cults false religions, etc. Here we see the church getting through all of that. They survived the heresies. They survived the onslaught. And now they're reigning with this lamb on Mount Zion. Now, Mount Zion is kind of like Camelot. Camelot was this mythical kingdom. Uh, it kind of, you know, I think it's in, in English or Anglophile lore. Uh, Zion is, the, is Jerusalem kind of reimagined. Like the, the heavenly Jerusalem, if you will, where the people of God dwell. So he sees, standing on Mount Zion with his redeemed, he sees Jesus. Right? So I'll read it for you again. And then I be, behold, I look, Mount Zion stood the Lamb, with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name on their foreheads. So these are sealed people. So again, mimicry. What did we read about last chapter? What are we seeing again? We're seeing this mark of the beast, 666. Where is it written? It's on your head. It's on your forehead. I don't think, personal opinion, is something we have to worry about in the future. Uh, some microchip that goes in your hand or your forehead that allows you to engage in commerce. Uh, I think it has more to do, because that wouldn't have meant anything to the people back then. It has more to do with the fact, hey, be aware. If the Shema, hero of Israel, the Lord thy God is, is, is one, and you shall love the God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your might, bind these things on your forehead and write them on your hand, this is mocking that. No, I don't want you to remember that God loves you. I don't want you to remember that that's your priority. 666, six, six. I want you to be concerned with yourself. Man, man, man. Let man be the object of your thoughts, not the things of God. Right? So these people are sealed correctly. These people are sealed. They're the eternal Shema, if you will sealed, sealed people with, with, with the very name of God on their forehead. So you see that kind of tit for tat, it's almost like a chess match. 
everything that God's doing, Satan just kind of counteracts. Okay, and so here you've got these people, and we saw the 144,000 before. Uh, we saw them earlier, um, but remember some, one interpretation that these 144,000 are redeemed Israelites, Jews for Jesus, that are ministering on the earth when the, the, er, the church is raptured. That's a futuristic interpretation. I think, however, it's just one of many pictures of the church on earth and the church in heaven, which I'll show you soon. But I just want to show you that the thrill of victory is the fact that we win. So Revelation is, is the most wonderful spoiler alert in the Bible. You can read about the reality of opposition, which you have experienced probably, uh, or you will experience to a certain degree if you're a Christian, which often in, in our Western world we don't have to worry about it too much. But if you're in other parts of the world, our church deals with it all the time. Um, you will certainly deal with disappointment because it's a broken planet. Uh, your, your heart will break. God will break your heart sometimes. It will be so frustrating because you won't know what he's doing. And often he's working at such a high level. You just have to remember that he loves you. And that love for you is proved on the cross. And that doesn't mean everything's going to go your way. Quite the opposite. When we're going through the I am statements, we remember that God the Father is a master pruner. He cuts stuff out of your life. And, and cutting stuff out of your life, it hurts. It's not pleasant. But the beautiful thing about that pruning is when a vinist or anybody who prunes uh, any type of vine, when, when that happens, they're closer than ever to the crop, right? They're closer than ever to the vine because you're trying to make sure you're cutting the right thing. So you can be assured that if God's doing anything painful in your life, it's not on accident. It's not because he's mean. He's doing something that's just too wonderful for us to understand. But as we, we, we were seeing the, the, the church through all of that, through all of that pain, through all that frustration, through those seasons where you just don't know, God, what are you doing? I don't understand what you're doing. We see the church on the other end here. And they're, they're crowned. And they're standing before God. And they're victorious. And they're singing a new song. And they're playing harps because harps are playing in the background. It's like, it sounds weird, roaring harps. So it just doesn't seem to go together. But that's, that's what John's seeing. And so it's this beautiful picture of victory through all the challenges that are sure to come and at this point have come and passed on earth. Does that make sense? And so the thrill of victory is centered around this scene, the first thing he sees. So the voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing their harps, and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. In it is these. So who are the 144,000? Next slide. So that you just so we saw them before. So in, in chapter 7, verse 3, these are the sealed servants of our God. So I made the argument that I don't think this is a future after the church is raptured, Jews for Jesus, Messianic Jews left on earth to minister to whoever's left behind. I think this is another picture of the church. Why? Well, we saw that they were sealed. Right? Being sealed is, is a sign of being God's people over and over again. You can read it in, in Ephesians. It says we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. That's a guarantee of our faith. And so I think that's one indicator that this is the church. Those who have the Lamb's name and His Father's name written on their foreheads, 14.1, another indicator of the church. Uh, those who are redeemed from the earth, that is a picture of the church. Uh, virgins who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. What's interesting is if you really get specific, almost always in Scripture, a virgin is a young female. So you get, it gets a little more confused. Okay, well, wait a minute. Are these 144,000 Messianic Jews that are all females? Or what, what, what are we saying? No, I think that's just conveying in, in four different passages of Scripture in the Old Testament. A virgin, virgin Israel. It's just, a dec it's just what God calls Israel. Even in the midst of their rebellion, he calls them virgin Israel. Because it's a term of endearment for his people. Those purchased from mankind are first fruits of God and the Lamb. Verse 14.4. So again, last time I checked, the church is purchased by the blood of God for the Lamb in verse 14.5, blameless. That's another beautiful thing about being a Christian. When you're washed by the blood of the Lamb, you are made blameless. And so who are the 144,000? It's just a picture of the church, one of many that we see in Revelation. 
Revelation 1 through 3, the seven churches are all pictures of the church. Real churches that existed in the past and real pictures of who we are as Christians today. So that was one we saw. The 24 elders is a picture, the Revelation 4, Revelation 11, of the crowned church in heaven. So you get these pictures of the church. It's kind of cool. It's like John keeps zooming in and out, showing you the church in the past, the church in the future, the church on earth, the church in heaven, the church persecuted, the church crowned, the church crushed, the church reigning. But you get this full 360 HD IMAX picture of the church throughout time. So the 24 elders, remember, 12 disciples, 12 tribes of, Is of Israel. The 144,000, part one in Revelation 7, the persecuted church on earth. 144,000, part two, what we just read, the victorious church in heaven. And then the two witnesses, I don't believe that personally, that it's, it's Moses or Elijah or Elijah or Enoch. I think when we read about them, they're called lampstands. I mean, who are the lampstands in the context of Revelation? It's the church. Why are there two of them? Because two witnesses are what was required to validate the message. This is a valid lampstand of God on earth to the unstoppable. Remember, they were persecuted, killed, and they rose from the dead and were taken up to heaven. So this is the unstoppable church on earth. And so John is showing you again and again in so many different ways. In a co this, is, this is in line with apocalyptic literature. He's trying to low-key show the church and encourage the church through symbolism that we are unstoppable and that because of Christ, we are going to reign forever. But until then, we're going to suffer and it's going to hurt. And the church was. This would be so purging to them because this is written in the middle of intense persecution and saying, it's okay, press on, because in the end we win. So he keeps on going back to that over and over and over again. Okay, so that's who the 144,000 is. Next slide. As now we want to look at the agony of defeat. So, so these different angels pop up. And what's interesting is you see a lot of sevens in Revelation. The seven churches. And the seven is the number of completion. So a complete picture of the church. The seven spirits before the throne of God. This is the Holy Spirit. A complete picture of the Holy Spirit. The seven trumpet judgments, the seven vial judgments, the seven bowl judgments, heightened reiterations of a perfect judgment against a guilty world in opposition to God and the people of God. And then seven angels keep popping up also. And I was thinking, like, well, there's six of them in the text. And that was really frustrating me, so I kept going back. Well, how, is there any connecting point? And what's interesting is if you go way back to chapter 10 – this mighty angel comes from heaven. He's the one that was like cloud, clothed in a rainbow and puts one foot on earth and one foot on the sea, which is interesting. Again, Satan tries to counteract that by putting one beast out of the earth, one beast out of the sea. But this mighty, mighty angel is the one who sets the tone for this chapter. So I think he's technically angel one, and then we're seeing six other angels in this chapter that make it a perfect seven of angels. Because in the next chapter, we're going to see seven different angels that blow seven trumpets. Of judgment. So again, John, through the Holy Spirit, is showing complete pictures. This is a complete judgment against the earth. This is a complete picture of the Holy Spirit. This is a complete picture of the church. All right, so angel number one, just to paraphrase, I think is back from chapter 10. Angel number two, we just read, is, is a proclaimer of grace. It's really beautiful what he says. So then I saw another angel flying directly overhead. With an eternal gospel, just like us, this is cool. Just the eternal good news. Like, this, think about that. We are going to be talking about the gospel forever. We will see it in Jesus when we see the scars of the lamb that was slain forever. And we will always remember that we were loved, rescued, and sealed forever in paradise. And so the eternal gospel, so this angel proclaimed the eternal gospel to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. So again, the scope is, is that a Western thing? Or, no, Christianity is global. It's a global thing. There are 2.2 billion Christians on the planet. It is the only global religion 
in the world because the scope has always been every people group. It's always been global. And so we see that now. This angel is proclaiming this eternal gospel to a global group of people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of judgment has come and worship him who made the heavens and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. So he just cuts down to it. He's like, hey, I just, I just want to remind you that you are here to fear God and obey God and have a relationship with God. That means keep God in awe. Keep, keep him as the focal point of your life because that's what you're wired for. That's what you were created to do. In the, in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, it says, what is the chief end of man? And it's to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's our, that is our primary focus in what we were created and wired to do. To glorify God through all the things that he's given gifts for. If it's making music, if it's singing, if it's teaching, if it's, if, if, if it's work, however you work your job or do your thing, parenting, singleness, all the, you're to give God glory in all those things. Redeem everything that God allows you to interact with. And then you're going to enjoy him. How many of you just forget that? Like, so you just enjoy God. So I think we, we, we complicate it. And we make it such a thing. But it's just literally this, the way Jesus taught us to pray, he started off with Abba, Father. Like, our Father, just that connection between a child and their Father. It begins with that. Enjoy God. And so this angel, angel number one in the text, two overall, he's a proclaimer of grace. So he's declaring the good news and what we're supposed to be doing. But then the next angel comes, and he's kind of dropping some bad news. He says, another angel, a second fall, and said, fallen, fallen. This is Babylon the Great. Remember, Babylon is symbolically, it's, it's the antithesis of Zion. So Babylon represents the antagonistic, evil opposition to the people of God. So he's just declaring Babylon has fallen. Babylon the great, who made all the nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. So, so Babylon is this licentious power that distracts the people of God. And that's always plagued the church. The great harlot, we talked about what are the three oppositions of the church that we'll see the harlot, the false prophet, and the beast. Right? The harlot is licentious living. John wrote elsewhere, do not love the world or the things of the world because everything in the world comes not from the Father but from the world. And then he describes it, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life comes not from the Father but from the world. He's just saying these things distract you. The things that you see, the things that you touch, the things that you want you see, don't let those things distract you from the main purpose, which is to glorify God and to, and to enjoy him. And so this angel proclaims judgment on Babylon. Say, hey, the system that, is, that has been in opposition to the church since the beginning of time, he's proclaiming judgment on it. He's saying it's fallen. Isn't it amazing? You know who the pull we're on? The pull that the world has on us? Just to be self-focused, self-glorifying center of attention, the things are just naturally there that you just fight, right? You fight against the flesh, you fight against the world, you fight against the devil. And that, could you imagine, would, the day God just snuffs that out and it's just not even there anymore. That pull is just removed. That's what the second angel, or third angel is proclaiming. So he's proclaiming judgment on Babylon. And then another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast or its image or receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will drink of the wine of God's wrath. And so the first wine mentioned is this wine of licentiousness that, 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 that gets you drunk and distracts and sidetracks you. The world that, that just lures you away from God. Dealt with. And then the second wine that's mentioned is this wine of judgment. That is, that, that's coming for anybody who's rejected the mark on their foreheads rejected the eternal gospel. And if you reject that, then you're automatically put to the inner realm. So it's pronounced judgment on the enemies of God. And then Jesus shows up. 
again. We see this, he's, he's described as the Son of Man. Now, often you'll see Jesus described in two ways, Son of God, Son of Man. Those are his two favorite like, self-descriptions. Uh, the Son of Man was just a, a recognition that Jesus was fully man. He wasn't 50-50. He was 100% man, Son of God. He was 100% God. The early church got really confused about this, and a lot of heresy kind of sprung around this. What was it, 80-20, 50-50? Uh, I don't like the thought of him being human. He's just spirit. No, he had to die on the cross for our sins. He had to experience temptation. So he's fully man, but he's also fully God. And so the Son of Man is always a title for Jesus. The fact that he's crowned is another fact that this is Jesus. And the fact that he's got a sickle. Now, at, at night, I try to read the Bible wider, and we just read this, the, the, this parable of the wheat and the tares, where if you remember this teaching, uh, Jesus said, uh, you know, a guy had a, uh, had a wheat field, and an enemy came and put weeds in it, tares, and at the end of the age, said the wheat and the weeds are separated. So this is describing what, what's happening now. So that, pr that, that parable is being fulfilled right now when Jesus shows up crowned with a, with, a, with a sickle and he swipes the earth and takes his people from, takes the wheat from the weeds so that all that's left to be judged now with the next angel that shows up with a sickle is judgment on the weeds, those who've rejected the gospel. Does that make sense? And so this is like a double reaping. The first is a rescuing reaping where he's taking, he, he's just, he, he's rescuing his people from judgment because they've made peace with God. And then that brings in the sixth angel who's a judging angel with a sickle. And he's the one who swings his sickle. And then there, between them, there's an exhorting angel who's kind of guiding things. He's like the general contractor saying, hey, let's, let's rescue here and let's judge here. And you got a seventh angel, and he's just called the angel of the authority of the fire, which is connected to the judgment that the people endure forever if you've rejected the eternal gospel. This passage of scripture is the most detailed description of, of what the judgment of God looks like. And this, they're hard words to read. I mean, look at this is this isn't pleasant what you when you when you read this. It says and he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels in the presence of God. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. These worshipers of the beast in his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. This picture of eternal judgment is horrific. In... in it really turns a lot of people off. Well, I'm just, how can a loving God do that? But this is the problem. We go to the next slide. You see, God is merciful and just. Like, he can't help it. It's who he is, right? If you read Exodus 34, 6 through 7, this is the first time that God officially describes himself in the Bible. This is Moses like, who are you? I, I want to see you. And this is what God says. God passes in front of Moses. Remember, he's like, I'll, I'll kill you if you see me. You can't see me, Moses. I'm too wonderful. I'm too beautiful. I'm too glorious. So I'm going to stick you behind a mountain. I'm going to pass by you. I'm going to put my hand up to block my glory from killing you. And I'm going to declare to you who I am. And so he says, Adonai, Adonai, uh, Yahweh. He says, this, this is who I am. So Adonai, Adonai, the Lord, the Lord compassionate and gracious is what he leads off with. Like That's who God is. I'm compassionate and I'm gracious. Slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Maintaining love for thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. So that's merciful. That's who God is. But yet, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. That is not talking about generational sin. Like you're getting punished for your great, great, great grandfather's sin. It's just saying sin has a 
a way of replicating itself generationally. It's always present. If there's not one generation that's less sinful than the other, it's just it's always there. It's cyclical until something ends it once and for all. And so this is who God is. God is just and God is merciful. He's not 50 50. It's, it's 100% justice, 100% loving. And that's why God can't just go, you know, you know, you rebels. Just to let it slide. I'm, cool. I, I'm a loving God. I'm just, you know, everyone's forgiven. It's all good. It's like, he can't do that. It's not in his character to do that. And that's why the gospel makes so much sense. That's why Jesus had to go to the cross, because someone had to be punished. For the sins of mankind, God does not delight in the death of the wicked. He does not want to punish us. He's just, somebody had to be punished, so he chose to punish himself. Which is such a trip when you think about it. That God would love you so much that he does not want you to go to this place that we read about in Revelation, that we're reading about in 14. And so that he would go there himself because Jesus went literally to Sheol for three days so that we wouldn't have to go there ever. And that's why the task of the church is to make disciples of all nations to explain the gospel to people because God doesn't want people to end up there. He wants you in that first part, right? He wants you up there singing a new song with him on Mount Zion forever and ever, not in eternal hopelessness and darkness forever and ever. Does that make sense? And so I just want to convey what, I at least appreciate the consistency of who God is. It's not wishy-washy. He's like, look, I'm merciful. I'm just. And so that's where Galatians 3.13-14 comes in. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole or a tree or a cross. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. That is saying, Jesus bore the wrath of God, a just God, but not from his own sins, because he didn't sin, for our sins. So he takes our sins and gives us his perfection, and that's the beauty of the gospel. The eternal gospel. That is what we'll be talking about forever and ever. That rescue mission that was accomplished on the cross for us is what we will be talking about forever and ever and ever. So God is merciful, but he's also just. And that's, and, and look, just there's other pictures of hell that I think complete that. Jesus described it as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. So that means it's a place of sorrow, but it's also a place of hatred, where you're fixed in your hatred of God. It doesn't say you're just like sorrow, like, oh, man, I wish I would have gotten I wish I would have, man, I, it says you, you are locked in hatred for God and the people of God. That's gnashing of teeth. That's, that's seething with hatred. So that's there. And I don't know if it ebbs and flows or depends on who you are, but so there's sorrow there. Weeping, but there's hatred there, gnashing of teeth. It is a place of, of no rest. Shalom is a description of, of, of what you receive in Christ. That's peace. Hell is the antithesis of shalom, no rest. It is restless, no peace. And if Jesus is light, we looked at that in the eye and say, I am the light of the world, then hell is a place of outer darkness, no light. Make sense, and so I just want to convey that the cost of both we see in Revelation 14 14, 14 4. Those who have been purchased and redeemed from mankind are first fruit for God and the Lamb, and in their mouth no lie is found, they are blameless. They're blameless because Jesus was blameless, and He made them blameless. All right, He makes us. Blameless. So the believer can stand, the Christian, the follower of God, can stand in the face of the great wrath of God in 14, that wine of wrath, 
and can stand in the face of any type of tribulation on earth because Jesus has already bore the wrath the believer deserved and has redeemed and purchased us by his blood. That's the wine of grace. And he sealed us six times in Revelation 7. It says that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit once and for all. So the beautiful thing about this chapter is what it cost Jesus to allow us to be on Mount Zion forever and ever with him. It cost him everything. He doesn't want you to face the wine of God's wrath. He doesn't want you distracted by the wine of the great harlot. He wants you redeemed by the wine that represents the blood of Christ. That's what he wants. That's his heart. In Christ, there is no condemnation, no judgment. You are victorious. You are blessed, verse 13, and you are at peace, verse 13. There is rest in that. So I just want to remind you, because it's easy to forget, and I think Revelation 14 shows this so clearly, that you are loved, that God is just, but God is also love. And he's done what was impossible for us to do on our own. And he, and he alone, died on the cross so that we could be made blameless and stand victorious on Mount Zion with him forever and ever. So my takeaway, I guess, was just persevere in that. Lewis, that was his main point last week. That word persevere, it's here in the text one more time. It's just, it's just persevere. Whatever God's got you in. And I'm certain with everyone in this room, we are a small number, there are things you are persevering through right now. I just want to remind you, it's longer than Revelation guarantees that life's hard, guarantees there'll be seasons where God breaks your heart. But over and over, these pictures of God, He still loves you. He's doing things we don't understand. And in the end, it all makes sense. And we win. And we're on Mount Zion singing a new song, playing harps that are super loud forever and ever and ever. And that's a beautiful thing. So hang your hat on that and persevere. Let's pray.